Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be able to welcome back Dr. Roseanne Kapana Hodge. How are you doing, Dr. Roseanne? I'm doing great. I'm glad we're having this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, and Roseanne has just released a new book. In fact, just came out in May called It's Going to Be It's Going to Be OK, Proven Ways to Improve Your Child's Mental Health. And so let's get to, let's get straight into it, uh, into it, Roseanne. So children's mental health was probably not something that was top of mind for a lot of people, even like pre pandemic, uh, you know, obviously, for people who have very obvious issues, or whatever, maybe, but just generally, I mean, it's not something that people typically talked about or thought about, like, well, let's sure. talk about my child's mental health. But I think it's come into sharp focus now, particularly through the pandemic, uh, probably should have been anyway, obviously, but here we are. Um, so what are some of the what are some of the signs for people that maybe your child is struggling a little bit? Yeah. And, you know, thank you for saying that it's coming to sharp focus. I mean, definitely a long term concern prior to the pandemic. And I think the pandemic just highlighted it and also, you know, highlighted the struggle that parents have. And as employers, we have to worry about all aspects of our employees' mental health because we're seeing how important uh, employee retention is. Yeah. And, you know, so this is something that, that they are thinking more about as we work from home and just people being in a heightened stress. And so, you know, what are the signs of mental health difficulties? And, you know, when it comes to kids and adults, there's a lot of crossovers and, Mental health struggles, stress can typically will show up first on the physical side. So what you'll see is sleep issues, you know, gastrointestinal difficulties, headaches, some pains, those kind of things, maybe heartburn. And, you know, we, when those kind of show up and they don't really fit in like, Hey, I didn't have a diet change. I didn't, I, um, I'm not doing things to keep me up at night. Like I'm sticking to a healthy sleep routine and all of a sudden, you know, I have pains in my chest, you know, you got to think about stress first. Um, another big sign is a change. So whether you're a parent, you're a partner or you're an employee, right? Or employer, I should say, you have to look at, wow, all of a sudden my most valuable employee started snapping at everybody on the team. What's going on? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, you know, so is somebody crabby? Is somebody withdrawn? It, you know, is somebody all of a sudden who's really talkative, stop talking, stop contributing, started showing up late, maybe looking disheveled. Um, those are signs that somebody could be struggling. And we often think because we're such a Gabby culture that people are going to be like, hey, I'm having a hard time or, oh, I've you know been having nightmares every night. No, that's not what happens. We're yeah, like, I, I was going to say, yeah, and um, sure, in, you know, in, in America, obviously, one of the things I like, come up from Ireland, I, I took my time to get used to still getting used to it after 25 years is how open people are about talking about things like just in general and uh you know in ireland we're far less, far more reserved and certainly when it comes to mental health issues you know that's a no-no to go there and and i think that despite the fact as you said despite the fact even in this culture that people are very open they don't that is still the one area that they may be quite reserved about going mm -hmm. because because they're afraid of the reaction afraid of the reaction and i think they're also you know, we are a culture, you know, a prideful culture that perceives mm -hmm. themselves as strong. And many people don't feel comfortable asking for help. And that's one part of it. But sometimes because stress, anxiety, depression, it typically creeps up on you. And yeah. so you're functioning at a very high level and you, you don't even recognize the signs in yourself. Right. And, and also it creeps up on your kids. So you may not be like, wow, you know, it's almost a blessing when it's a sudden and you're like, yeah. something's really wrong here, you know, mm -hmm. um, but typically it's an unwinding and, and, you know, and then when you look back, 
back and you try to connect the dots, right? Because you got to a crisis point. Um, we can only connect the dots looking back. That's what Steve yeah. Jobs says. Um, and it's the same in mental health. And so, you know, there's a lot of factors, but you know, you're right. We, we talk about it like in a flip way, like, oh, I'm so OCD or oh, I'm stressed. And, you know, <laughs> and, and yeah. stress is such a part of our culture that nobody thinks it's bad. No, no. In fact, uh, you know, you're right. Again, they're almost quite the opposite. Uh, they think it's it's a byproduct of, uh, if you like, it's a way of showing how hard you're working. Yes. Um, but there's something you just said a moment ago, and I think that's a, a I think it's a very, very good point. Is it's like this. It's um, it, as I said. I mean, I was I'm, I'm from Ireland, so like whenever I would go, whenever I would go back, or when I go back to Ireland, like, and I I haven't seen somebody in a year or two, maybe two, three years, right? I go, wow, you know, that person has changed a lot. But to the people there, they're like, really? I didn't see it. To your point is, when we're when we're around people all the time, we don't, I mean, certainly ourselves don't notice the change, but also we don't always notice the changes in others because as you yes. said, they're gradual. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, we don't often think about anxiety, depression, or even somebody with suicidal ideation. We don't think of them as people that are walking around functional. And that is absolutely a big, huge myth. It's really that people are functioning and typically people can function at a really high level in a certain area of their life. Maybe it's at home with their kids, maybe it's at work. And then there's going to be an area where it's impacting them, right? Because that's what makes something the difference between stress and a clinical issue is that there is a significant impact in one or more areas of a person's life. And yes, some people become completely shut down and they can't get out of bed or, um, you know, they're constantly bickering and angry, like it's to that level. And, and, but the majority of people with mental health issues are walking around and don't even recognize how distressed they are. Yeah, and I think that's such a, an important point for people because, yeah, you're because I think oftentimes people think, OK, if you've got mental health issues, like you've got depression or whatever is, oh, well, then that person probably like lies in bed all day and locks themselves yeah. away and doesn't interact. They don't realize that there's people, as you said, there's there's people with mental health issues, with depression, whatever, who who you would never even know it. You wouldn't even know yeah. it. And and they're very good at kind of high. Yeah, we're very good at hiding it. Um, but to your point is it's it's um you know we have this misconception that that it's one extreme right it's like you're you're depressed oh therefore you must be lying in bed all day right no you're not you're, you're walking not around functioning. no yeah you're, you're more likely to show up somebody who's anxious and depressed right there's a spectrum so there's your internalizers and then there's there are your externalizers and your internalizers are the people where, you know, they're a little nervous in the inside, right? Like I have a new admin and she's a doll, but she's very open. She says, I'm an anxious person. And I literally can watch her. Now I can see. And I, when I give her a new task, I'm like, sweetheart, it's a new task. You are not supposed to know what you're doing. She's, yeah. I'm like, you need to be okay with that. Cause we're okay with that. She's like, okay. You know? And so, <laughs> you know, so she, you can see that she, she starts to her body. She gets little movements. She gets a little red. She gets a little anxious. She gets quiet. Right. And then your externalizers are people that are really ornery and cranky and maybe lash out. I mean, these are tough people on a team, you know, yeah. where you're like, oh, please don't put me with Barry, please. Barry is always like biting my head off, you know, um, and we, we think of sometimes that these things are personality characteristics, which, which they can be, but a lot of times they reflect a deeper mental health issue, which is, which is also very trick, John, tricky as an employer, you know, we're not allowed to be like, are you depressed, right? We're not allowed. But what you can say is, I see you're having a hard time with X, Y, and Z. Is there something I can do to support you? you know, mm -hmm. um, or, you know, what's on your mind, you know, I mean, just, just asking those questions. I've learned as, as a leader of, of a team, um, at our center that whenever I see somebody, I'm like, this is an opportunity for mentoring and caring. And in a time when people are so distressed, it's the best advice I can give to anybody, whether you're a manager or running a company is to actually really making sure you're checking in with your employees because uh, nobody left the pandemic unscathed in some way, shape or form. Um, 
I, I I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And and to be honest, I mean, we won't even know as uh, as you know better than I do. We yeah. won't even know we won't even know the impact of it for for a long time to come. And we'll probably look back and be quite shocked about the certainly about the mental health impact. Um, talk to me a little bit about. So stress is a word that gets thrown around a lot and people have different concepts of it. And some people think, oh, I'm just stressed because I'm overwhelmed right now, but it'll be OK. But just talk a little bit about the effects that stress has, because I noticed you talk about this in your book, the effect of stress on the brain and body. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we think we are immune from the effect of stress. And I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter <laughs> if it's good or bad stress. There is going to be a physical or a mental health effect of chronic stress. This is, we cannot run an empty, right? So again, we are very much a society, you know, where you are in Europe, they take time off. They do stuff, right? You know, they, they're they not getting two weeks vacation. You know, the standard in Europe yeah. is typically six or more weeks, you know, people uh -huh. take it. You know, yeah, my dad, you know, they do my dad's um, first generation American and just sold a very, very successful company at 83 years old, you know, goes to was going to work. He still he sold the company he's still going every day, just just so everybody knows. <laughs> and um, at 83, you would never know he's 83. He's like physically moves and has cognitive capacity of at least somebody 20 years younger. And he says to my husband, who has more than six weeks off. I mean, what happens when you take six weeks? I mean, do they call you? I mean, are you allowed to take six weeks? He says to my husband, like, he's like, can't believe that my husband, my dad's like, you know, my husband's like, they can't call you on vacation, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, it was pretty funny. Like he couldn't, you know, he's become so Americanized. Like he didn't take time off, you know, he just yeah. didn't do it. But, and I, and um, I have to, and I, and I have to admit that I, I'm the same. Like after 25 yeah. years here now, I'm the same. And that sometimes it's like, I mean, I even catch myself sometimes thinking, oh my God goodness, you're off again. You're another vacation, you know, for the people who work for us in Europe. I'm like, what? Yeah. Again? Yeah. <laughs> Tell you right. what, like why don't you just, why, instead of just sending me the days you're going to be off, how about you just send me the days you're going to be working? It'd be quicker. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's really true. And so, you know, we think about our stress system. There's a part of our body called the autonomic nervous system, and it manages our stress response. And at the top is our stress response. It's, it's called sympathetic dominant. At the bottom is a relaxed parasympathetic state. And if you have a healthy nervous system, it kind of lives in this parasympathetic state. You know, somebody says something irritating to you, you get a little irritated and then it goes back down, but we're, we're not powering down, right? I always say you have to power down to power up. You can't live in overdrive. Um, and you, we are, and what's happening is people are getting more agitated, more clinical issues are resulting because they're just in a chronic overdrive, right? Um, and some people get autoimmune diseases, some people have anxiety and depression, but, you know, and, and I think it's really surprising to people, John, that they, they don't realize like in the top three things that are most stressful, it's actually divorce, death, and then it's like marriage and a baby, Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are joyous, but stressful things. And, and, move, you know, we, and moving and moving as <laughs> moving is very stressful. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, back a while ago, I mean, uh, I got married and we had a baby and then we moved like all within a short space of time. And I'm we're looking back going, my goodness, I'm surprised we didn't kill each other. I mean, for sure. Right. Like, how <laughs> did you live through that? <laughs> My um, stylist today was telling me how um, a, a year ago we had a microburst tornado in our area. And he said, oh, I remember that week. I thought I was getting divorced. No air conditioning, no this. And we were just having such a chuckle. And I was like, Nino, honey, you don't get divorced. You work it out. You love each yeah. other. You work it out. He's like, I know. But it was really stressful. He goes, next time I go to a hotel. I'm like, that's right. You know, yeah. so we we all have certain things and, and not everybody's stressors are the same. And, you know, I am I like to talk about a resiliency mindset and yeah. it's how you view, manage and recover from stress. And you have somebody like me who is always doing activities that keep keeps my nervous system in this relaxed parasympathetic state called the hot tub state. I just don't view stressors in the same way. Like I don't react in the mm -hmm. same way, you know, and these are the kind of things we need to do for ourselves to protect ourselves. I mean, if, if we didn't learn 
that we better freaking manage stress in this <laughs> pandemic, we're in trouble. Yeah, I like that. I like also that you say uh, that you talk about detoxification, a little known game changer in mental health, because when you were just talking, I just writing a couple of things down here. I was I was just reflecting on, uh, as you say, we don't power down because let's yeah. face it, we're, we're we're in the middle of work, right? We're consumer work. And then we have these devices that are harassing us, harassing um, yeah. And and what do we do first thing in the morning? We look on the social media or the news sites on our phone like we're, we're not even out of bed yet. And already we're annoyed. Right. Because let's face it, the news isn't to inform. It's to uh, it's to provoke. And this whole comparison culture, if you go on social media, it's like, oh, look where they are today and I have to do this. So we're like we're like doing everything we can to ensure that we never power down. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And, you know, um, you know, you mentioned I talk about detoxification, it's detoxification of our systems, right? But mm -hmm. it also means detoxification of our technology, right? And you are right. This is a really harassing device. It's pretty <laughs> addictive. There's notifications there. Gram my my uh, 10 year old is with his Grammy at the beach. <laughs> so I've got all these pictures waiting for me. That's good stuff. But still, your brain doesn't have a moment to have downtime and be away from it, you know? And, you know, there's things we can do. I know when I like have dinner or anytime I'm with my kids, I really try to actually put yeah. my phone away. Um, mm -hmm. Unless there's like an emergency happening, uh, you know, like I know something, I've got to get it away from me because even if you try not to, the next thing you know, you have it flipped up. And you're mm -hmm. like, how did that happen? Because we're getting that constant feedback, right? And it's just not healthy. We need some downtime for our brain, our nervous system to get into that relaxed state, which we often resist, like us type A people resist. But once you realize how much it actually makes your brain work faster <laughs> and how much better you feel, it becomes a pretty easy routine, but you have to make it a routine to protect your mental health. Yeah, uh, but uh, and, and like I said, I'm glad you raised that because I do think, OK, if you talk to most people and say to them, you know, detoxify your body physically or you look at your diet, you need to uh, yeah. have a healthier diet. Most people can get their head around that. Right. They're, they go. Yeah, it makes sense. I know, understand that. But if you say, well, actually, you also have to be careful about your mental diet. What are you feeding your mind? What are you feeding your brain? And and how are you detoxing? How are you cleansing your system of all the nonsense that you doesn't need to be there? Yeah, I mean, and so true. And, you know, I'm so glad you bring up that we're a compare culture. And I think it happens at such a subconscious level. Nobody thinks that they're comparing. But when you do the scroll and people are only putting what is staged, sure. You know, um, I think it's really easy to get into a comparison culture, you know, and and that doesn't feel good. You know, it really, really doesn't. And it really creates a lot of insecurity and kind of feeds these negative voices that, you know, people nobody's harsher to themselves than their own mm -hmm. inner voice. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's such a limiter in success in all areas, you know, um, and it's always so shocking to me, John, I hang out with some pretty well-known people and they all have the whole imposter syndrome and insecurity. And, you know, I got a lot of things. I don't have that because my voice is kind to me. So mm -hmm. I really say to myself, like kind things, you know what I mean? So um, and I think when you do do that, you you break that that cycle. But at a subconscious level, we're constantly comparing each other because of the scroll. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm glad you raised that too. Uh, the the idea of being kind to yourself and the kind voice, because yeah, I mean we're super critics, we're super personal critics, and and I read somewhere in Psychology Today or something about like our sixty seven percent or seventy percent of our self talk daily is negative. Um, yeah. So so not only are maybe we're getting feedback that's not great from other people, but it's nothing compared to the feedback we're giving ourselves. Yeah, and you know we make almost 35,000 decisions a day and over 70% of them are to avoid something they're fear-based. Mm -hmm. And then you couple it with what you said that we have <laughs> such negative self-talk and, and, a, and a lot of how we talk to ourselves is how our parents um, role modeled for us. 
right? You know, and, and maybe you had, you know, um, you know, my parents were born around the war, right? And so World War II. And, um, you know, people have different ideas about, you know, fear-based things like, oh, I'm afraid of this. Okay, because you were a kid growing up in World War II, I get it. Um, But most people aren't really, they think they're nurturing their kids to be really positive, but instead it's like, well, if you don't get an A on this test, you're never going to school. That's very, very different language than saying, wow, I so look forward to your effort paying off. And really, you know, I say to my little guy all the time, I can't wait to see what you do. I'm so excited. You have so many options. It's pretty cool. I never, never, never say any of those things. You know, I also tell him, I can't wait till you give me an awesome daughter-in-law. I tell you that. So (laughs) (laughs) yeah, yeah, well, I I would, uh, I would put that off for as long as you can just, well, Hey, you know, I'm just letting him know, you know what I mean? So he put a kibosh. I was like, you're going to live next door. And he's like, no, I'm like, okay. You know, it's really funny, but we have to, we have to set the tone and, you know, visionaries in, in the world of creation and business. And they're all, they never say, you think Tony Robbins goes around and says, this isn't going to happen. You know, no, they, they say it and they see it in a positive light. And we need to just do that same thing to shut down some of these inner negative workings for ourselves. But but also because what we are role modeling at such a deeply subconscious level for our own children. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And, and it, it is it is amazing how much of a residual stuff from your childhood flows through. I mean, I know it's I know it's that old cliche. And I think a lot of people that's why a lot of people are put off ever looking at it. You know, that like, tell me about your relationship with your father or your mother. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, but the reality is that, that yeah. there are, there are, you do bring, you do bring things through with you and things that triggers and things that trip you yeah. up that, that don't have to, it's just that they they're legacy things. No. Mm-hmm. And there's wonderful things. You know, I always say, no matter what kind of terrible upbringing or positive, there's always something to gain mm-hmm. from the way you were brought up. But, you know, the way our parents parented us was a different time. It's not going to always serve us now, but we can take things, right? You know, um, recognizing that all of our money values are inherited, right? That's a big one that stops people. So if that's inherited, what, what what serves you well there? What can you take as a value and what do you need to alter, right? And I think these dialogues are so important because it just opens the ideas for people, you know, like, oh, I never really thought of it like that. So we don't have to be chained to whatever past limiting beliefs or, or tragedies or traumas that have happened to us. And, and we can move forward, but you got to be conscientious and you have to stop talking about it and you have to do action, you know? Yeah. And I think one of the hardest things sometimes is for people to realize that, um, yeah, whatever experiences you had with your parents, uh, you know, good, bad, or indifferent is, they were they were a product as you said a product of the time that they grew up in and their parents and all that and they may have had a limited amount of tools they maybe do have have been doing the best job they could have done with the tools that they had at their disposal at at the time well said well said you know and so we can embrace what serves us and and change what doesn't yeah. And also, I mean, it's a good it, it 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 helps also with understanding and saying, yeah, OK, well, I didn't really like that or that didn't impact me very well. But I kind of get now where it was coming from. It still wasn't good, but I get where it was coming from. Yeah, um, absolutely. One last thing, though. Um, so how, calming, calming your nervous system. So just a little piece of advice for people as, as we end this. If you are feeling you're getting stressed, if you are getting uptight, if there are things happening to you, how do you, how do you start to calm yeah. that? Yeah. Well, first of all, don't ignore it, right? So, mm. you know, you got a lot of type A's listening. And so <laughs> we tend to like to ignore things, right? And I've been there too. I mean, I'm not going to lie, you know you have to conscientiously address it. So if you're feeling tightness in your chest or you're getting hot and sweaty or whatever, lean into it and say, how can I improve that? Literally, if you say that to your subconscious and you take a moment and maybe it's breath work for you, maybe it's doing, you know, what we call belly breath, a diaphragmatic breath. Maybe it's taking a a walk. Maybe it's a gratitude journal for a moment. But if you don't take moments to actually sit in that for a minute and then find a way to healthily tamp it down. It's just going to keep going up 
ramping up, ramping up, ramping up. And then it's going to show up in a way that's going to knock you on your butt. So don't ignore, take a moment, find some healthy tools for your toolkit and address it. Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. Well, listen, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Roseanne. This is Dr. Roseanne, Roseanne Kapana Hodge. The book is It's Going to Be Okay Proven Ways to Improve Your Child's Mental Health. But it sounds very much like to me that it'll probably reading a book like that will not only help you with your child, probably help you with yourself a lot as well. So um, and let's face it, if, if there's one thing that we really owe to ourselves first, but also to our kids after the period we've been through is we need to take care of their mental health um, because we you know we've been through different types of uh, of of events and traumas and stuff in our lives at this stage these guys haven't and it was so unprecedented and not something that you know kids ever really have to go through and so yeah we have to be real careful so i would really encourage people to check the book out um, and which will be linked below this video. So before we go, Dr. Roseanne, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and the services you offer. Yeah, well, you know, I'm somebody who works with people still in person in my Ridgefield, Connecticut Center, but I also work with people virtually all over the world, mostly doing neurofeedback and biofeedback, and um, which is a way to calm down your nervous system and use technology to really get your brain optimized and back on track, make you focused and calm and um, address whatever's kind of going on. So it's pretty cool. I have clients in Saudi Arabia and Asia right now. So wow. um, so that's, that's pretty much the way that I work with people. And my book is a great way to start to understand. It really is for anybody. I'm just on such a mission to change kids' mental health because it really was a crisis before the pandemic and we can do so much better by them. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And they live, they live in a very complex world today. Uh, so complex. Um, it, uh, I mean, when I look back, uh, you know, when I talk to my son about the pre-internet days and back in Dublin, when I was growing up, he always kind of looks at me like I'm, I might as well be saying yes, and we lived in a cave and we used to have to run from dinosaurs. So. <laughs> what was this thing called Atari you had, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't have one. A oh, my brother had, had one. Yeah. I didn't have one. My brother. No, had one. a friend had one. Yeah, and I still, you know, I'm still holding on to some things. Like I never got a, a, a I never got a, a Stretch Armstrong when I was a kid because we couldn't. Afford oh my one. God, John, like, we'll uh... have to talk about this in a therapy session. I, exactly. I know. I know. I'm holding on to that one. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, so great to talk to you again, Dr. Roseanne. And as I said to people, all the links will be below. Please check it out. I think it's something that if there's nothing else you do this year, please check in on your kids' mental health. All right. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.